Chapter 21 Professor Slocum drew together the great curtains and turned to address the small conclave gathered in his study. The group, three in number, watched the old man warily. The first, Jim Pooley by name, leant against the marble mantelshelf, fingering a magnificent pair of mustachios he had chosen to cultivate. The second, a man of Irish extraction who had recently sold his razor at a handsome profit, lounged in a fireside chair almost unseen behind a forest of curly black beard. The third, a shopkeeper and a victim of circumstance, toyed nervously with his whisky tumbler and prayed desperately for an opportunity to slip away and feed his camel. There was one last entity present at this gathering, but he was ethereal stock and invisible to the naked eye. Edgar Allan Poe was maintaining the lowest of all low profiles. I have called you here, gentlemen, said Professor Slocum, because we have almost run out of time. We must act with some haste if we are to act at all. You have reached a solution, then? asked Jim, hopefully. Possibly, the old gentleman made a so-so gesture with a pale right hand, although I am backing a rank outsider. I'm not a mad fave long odds myself, said O'Malley, unless, of course, I have a man on the inside. Quite so. Believe me, I have given this matter a very great deal of thought. I have possibly expended more mental energy upon it than I have ever done upon any other problem. I feel that I might have come up with a solution, but the plan relies on a goodly number of factors working to our favour. It is, as you might reasonably expect, somewhat fraught with peril. Tell us the worst, then, said O'Malley. I think you can call us committed. Thank you, John. In essence, it is simplicity itself. This worries me a little. Possibly because it lacks any of those conceits of artistic expression which my vanity holds so dear. It is, in fact, a very dull and uninspired plan. But nevertheless, fraught with peril. Sadly, yes. Under my instruction, so distant has turned the elopements into a veritable minefield. The explosive use is of my own formulation, and I can vouch for its efficacy. I intend to detonate it as the first craft land. We may not be able to destroy all of the invading vessels, you understand, but if we can wipe out one or two of the lead ships, then I think it will give us the edge. But what about the rest of them? asked Pooley. That is where we must trust very much to psychology. These beings have travelled a very long way to return to their home world. As you are all well aware, it no longer exists. When they discover this, they will be logically asking themselves the big why. They are being guided here by the communicating beacon to Swan. But if the first craft to land are instantly destroyed, then I feel it reasonable to assume that they will draw their own conclusions. They will reason that the men of Earth have evolved into a superior force, which is capable of destroying entire planets, should it so wish. I can only hope that they will hastily take themselves elsewhere. They have a very long, long way to call for reinforcements, should any actually exist. I can accept that in theory, said O'Malley, but with some reservations. There are a goodly number of ifs and buts to it. I accept it wholeheartedly, said Jim. My name has so far gone unmentioned and that suits me well enough. There are one or two little matters to be cleared up said Professor Slocum, somewhat pointedly. That is where you come in. This would be the fraught with peril side of it, I expect, said Jim, dismally. Professor Slocum nodded. There is a small matter of the communicating beacon in the swan. It will have to be switched off. We cannot afford to have the Syrians here giving the game away now, can we? Jim shook his head gloomily. I suppose not, he said. We have only one opportunity to deal with the thing, and that is tomorrow night. I have to play with the finals tomorrow night, Norman complained. O'Malley here promised I would do so. You haven't fulfilled your side of the bargain yet, said the voice behind the beard. The machine still hums. You've done nothing. I haven't had a chance yet. I can't get in there. I'm barred. Don't you remember? Steady on now, said Professor Slocum, raising a pale hand. All can be reconciled. The machine cannot be broken, said Jim. Be assured of it. We are doomed. I can vouch for the fact it cannot be destroyed from within the swan, the professor said, because I have already tried. Come again, said Pooley. Fair dues, said Professor Slocum. You surely do not believe that I have been idle? All present shook their heads vigorously. My retainer Gammon, despite his advanced years and decrepit appearance, is a master of disguise. Twice he has visited the swan with a view to disabling the device. 
Firstly, he arrived in the guise of a brewery representative come to check the electrics. He assured me that the machine cannot be switched off in any manner whatever, and also that Neville has no love whatever for brewery representatives. Later, he returned as an engineer come to service the device prior to switching it off. This time he received a three-course meal on the house, washed down with half a bottle of champagne, but still met with complete failure. Even a diamond-tipped drill could not penetrate the machine's shell. I told you we were doomed, said Pooley. I'm for a Jack Palance mask and a dark suit, me. Norman shifted uneasily in his chair. I really think I must be going, he said. Can't do anything if I can't get inside the machine. Feel free to contact me at any time, but for now, goodbye. Not so fast, said Professor Slocum. I've given the matter much thought, and I feel that I've found the solution. Can I go anyway? Norman asked. I do have to be up early in the morning. Test drive in your Morris, O'Malley asked. The shopkeeper slumped back into his chair. We are dealing, said Professor Slocum, with beings that, although possessed of a superior intelligence, are not altogether dissimilar to ourselves. They are of the opinion that we are a rising but still inferior race. They might have your card marked, Pooley, but I doubt whether they have contemplated upon sabotage. Certainly, their machine is outwardly protected, but it might have its weakness if attacked from a different direction. How so? Pooley asked. From behind. The thing is faced against the wall of the swan. My belief is that if we break through from behind, we might find little resistance. Well, through the wall of Archie Karachi's curry garden. I can't see Callie's curry king giving us a go-ahead on that one. But Archie Karachi is a member of the Swan's darts team. I myself have seen a sign on his door closed for business all day Thursday. Pooley tweaked to the end of a mustachio whose length would have brought a jealous glance from Salvador Dali himself. With all the noise in the Swan, said he, nobody's going to pay much attention to a bit of banging next door. My thoughts entirely. We will need a spy on the inside, though, just to keep an eye out. Gammon will take care of that side of it. When we have broken through to the machine, it will be down to you, Norman, to deal with it appropriately. No problem there, said the shopkeeper, blowing on his fingertips. There's no machine built which I cannot get to grips with. You might find a surprise or two when we open it. Child's play? said Norman with sudden bravado. He was quite warm into the idea of all of this. He'd never liked Archie Karachi very much, and the thought of knocking down his kitchen wall held great appeal. Also, if this machine was everything the professor seemed to think it was, it was bound to contain more than a few serviceable components. Just laid me to it. O'Malley chuckled behind his whiskers. Bravo, Norman, said the professor, smiling profusely. Now, if you will pardon me, I suggest that we bring this meeting to a close. I have several loose ends to still to tie up. The old man took a scrap of paper from his pocket and held it to each man in turn. We'll meet tomorrow, 7.30pm, sharp at this address. Please do not speak it aloud. The three men committed the thing to memory. With the briefest of goodbyes and nor handshaking, they took their leave. Professor Slocum closed the French windows behind them and bolted the shutters. Now, he said, returning upon the silent room, will you make yourself known to me of your own accord, Mr. Poe, or must I summon you into visibility? I should prefer that we did it the easy way, said Edgar Allan Poe. We have much to speak of.